Professor Ron Watson is a scholar at Eaton College and King's College, Cambridge. For more than 30 years, he taught classics and English at Harrow School, where he was also active in the design of an Elizabethan stage and in the directing of the plays of Shakespeare. He has lectured at Stratford-upon-Avon in London, throughout the United Kingdom, and in many other countries. He is on the Council of the St. George's Elizabethan Theater and is a Vice President of the Shakespeare Reading Society. In 1965, he was George Fulmer Reynolds Lecturer at the University of Colorado, and in a four-month tour gave more than 50 lectures at American colleges and universities. Since then, he has made lecture tours in this country in 1969, 1971, 1972, 1974, and 1976, and he is back again with us in 1978. Yet the sheer amount of work that Professor Watkins continues to do, as well as the joy that he brings to that work and the apparent rejuvenation that he draws from it become widely known, I would speculate that the learned world may begin to speculate on the virtue of abandoning their own fields of endeavor and taking up the study of Shakespeare. <laughs> Professor Watkins has written Moonlight at the Globe, which describes an Elizabethan performance of A Midsummer Night's Dream, and on producing Shakespeare, which discusses in detail the methods he has developed through his practical experience on the Elizabethan stage. He is also the co-author with Jeremy Lemon of the series in Shakespeare's Playhouse. He has, in addition, written articles for such periodicals as Theater, Drama, The Shakespeare Yardbook, and The Philological Quarterly. In May 1976, he received the honorary degree of Doctor of Humane Letters from the University of Colorado. We live in an age which provides us sometimes with unusual and interesting performances of Shakespeare's plays. We are, for example, shown a Hamlet shuffling about the stage of the South American Banana Republic under a huge sombrero. Or we are taken into Auschwitz for the Merchant of Venice and find all characters, save one, in Nazi uniforms. Such performances may bring us delight and instruction. But that same delight and instruction can also be gained from seeing or hearing about the production of Shakespeare's plays as one might have seen them in the Globe Theater. Our speaker tonight will address that subject, and his topic is Shakespeare in his own playhouse, the conditions of performance, and their influence on Shakespeare's writing. Professor Ronald Watson. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Haggard, for your very kind welcome, and all of you for being here. Uh, if you are a, a wandering minstrel or a strolling player such as I am, you never quite know how you are going to be received. I was once introduced to a platform at Stratford-upon-Avon as, and I quote, that dangerous person, a man with a mission. Um, <laughs> it is true, I have a mission, but missionaries are not usually dangerous, they are just unpopular except, of course, when it comes to boiling them for dinner, and uh, unpopular even then when they prove to be tough and hard to swallow. The doctrine I am here to preach is a simple one, and being both radical and reactionary, it is, as I say, unpopular. Briefly, it is this, that to understand and appreciate Shakespeare's plays to the full, we must present them, or if we can't do that, imagine them, in the conditions for which they were first written. This is not popular with the stage designers, nor with the lighting experts, nor altogether with the ladies for the very understandable reason that it threatens, this is a threat only, and not a very serious one either, to exclude them from the delights of Shakespearean production. It is unpopular with most actors too, and this is likewise understandable because it suggests that they must learn a new approach to their art and it is above all unpopular with ambitious directors because it seems to hamper the exercise of their invention. With all this weight of opposition before me, let me therefore try to propitiate by limiting my aim. I don't wish to be understood as declaring that Shakespeare's way is the only way to perform Shakespeare. I am only saying that Shakespeare's way, as far as my experience goes, is the only way in the professional theater that is not tried. 
And this seems to me to be wrong if you believe, as I do firmly, that Shakespeare knew very well what he was about. There should be somewhere in the English-speaking world a playhouse where you can be sure of seeing not those eccentric variations that are the fashion in London and Stratford-upon-Avon, uh, and as Dr. Haggard has reminded us, in the United States too, but the thing itself. And I'm sure that half measures are not enough in this crusade. There is a tendency to pay lip service to the idea of Elizabethan Jacobean production, to speak of fluid action on the apron stage and speedy continuity against the background of a permanent set, specially designed for each new occasion, as if these which are certainly desirable features were all that was necessary to restore Elizabethan conditions. And as if anyway it is the task of the 20th century director to present Shakespeare in a way more suited to the sophisticated tastes of a modern audience. <laughs> the cult of the globe, it might be thought, has had its day, has been a passing fad, an eccentric fashion of the purists, which may now be put back on the shelf where it belongs. But it is because I know from the experience of now more than 30 years that it is very much more than this, that I have put into words my belief that this is a practical and simple way of rediscovering, I'm measuring my words, rediscovering the lost stagecraft of one of the few great poetic dramatists of Western civilization. The lost stagecraft to rescue Shakespeare's plays from oblivion in the 20th century, this might seem to be an arrogant or at least a quixotic ambition. But in one respect, Shakespeare is in limbo, and that respect a cardinal one. It's known, of course, that he was a poet of unique accomplishment. It's recognized that on almost every topic of human experience, even in our own sophisticated time, he has something memorable to say. And it's generally agreed that as a creator of character studies, of fine acting roles, he has no equal. And I suppose that the hardest bitten of impresarios has a hunch that this fellow, uh, with proper adaptation, of course, will draw money to the box office but that he knew how to make a play, that he knew better than any of his contemporaries, his predecessors and his successors, how to create the material of poetic drama. This neither the professional, whether director or critic, seems to understand, nor his dupe, the uncritical playgoer or reader, to believe. My purpose is therefore, as I've said, a missionary one, to denounce the wanton and ignorant perversity of the priesthood and to try to satisfy the yearnings of the would-be faithful, those hungry sheep who look up and are not fed. <laughs> but the first problem of missionaries is to persuade men of the need for conversion. Here then, in plain terms, is the abomination in our midst. The plays that Shakespeare made have not been publicly performed since the closing of the playhouses in 1642. Today, neither at Stratford-upon-Avon, the poet's native place, nor in London, the scene of his active life in the playhouse, is it possible to taste his quality. His fellow countrymen do not know his greatness, and visitors from overseas who come on pilgrimage from the ends of the earth to sample the essential genius of Shakespeare are sent away baffled, bewildered, disappointed, don't you find this? Or what is worse to me, tricked into thinking that they have seen the truth. The truth is that there is a fundamental difference of medium between Shakespeare's theater and our own. This fundamental difference can be quite simply stated. The Elizabethan Playhouse depended for its dramatic effect upon the creative power of the spoken word. Our theater of today, for the most part, does not. The theater of the Greeks, with its traditional austerity of setting on the hillside, bred poetic drama of universal theme and cosmic expression, the Elizabethan Playhouse likewise bred poetic drama, but its greater intimacy, which was due to its confinement within that wooden O, 
could house the particular as well as the universal, the domestic no less than the cosmic. What was common to both Greek and Elizabethan, and what is lacking in the theater of today, was a permanent familiar setting for the speech and action of the players. Though we cannot now be certain of their form, to the Londoner of 1600, the features of the stage and tiring house were so familiar that they could be ignored at the will of the dramatist or else used by him for the setting of some episode in his drama. But it was the spoken word that controlled what Shakespeare's audience saw. The words contained and created the drama. So I would like in this lecture to present to you an impression of those first performances in Shakespeare's Playhouse more as an exercise of our combined imagination, yours and mine, uh, than as a practical suggestion for rebuilding that playhouse in the 20th century, though of course there's plenty of room here. Uh, let me confess I have never in all these years given up the hope that sometime, somewhere, the man, the company, the conditions, the economy, the opportunity might come together uh, under the influence of some auspicious star and the globe might rise again. Uh, but meanwhile, let us not be afraid to entertain conjecture. This is, after all, what Shakespeare himself is fond of inviting us to do. So first of all, let me set the scene for you. What can we assume? What are we allowed by the general consensus of scholarly opinion to think? Were the permanent features of Shakespeare's playhouse? And what were the normal conditions of performance? Well, I think everybody knows that the building was a round one. Whether polygon, octagon, or circle, it was round, a wooden O. And the dimensions are of the greatest importance, and the relative proportions of stage and auditorium. The overall diameter from wall to wall, not much more, they tell us, than 80 feet. That's the outside wall. And if your mathematical sense is as vague as mine, let me help you by reminding you that the length of a lawn tennis court is 78 feet, so that the outer wall of this building is not much wider than the length of a lawn tennis court. And the stage, more than 40 feet wide, that's half the width of the building, and nearly 30 feet deep out that way. And the middle of the front of the stage was the central point of the whole building. And the yard where the groundlings stood was open to the sky, the afternoon London sky, usually a pretty murky affair. It was surrounded by galleries under cover, and the ceiling of the top gallery out of three would be about 35 feet above ground level. And the audience sat or, or stood round three sides of the stage. Uh, the first thing to notice about this disposition is the extraordinary intimacy of the performance. Hamlet in soliloquy out there in the front of the stage, to be or not to be, is no further from any member of his audience than, well, than a, a tennis player standing up at the net is from the opponent's baseline. And that goes for the galleries as well as the yard. And the second is the paradoxical sense of being in a great crowd. The capacity of the galleries and the yard is estimated at something, they tell us, between two and 3,000 people, uh, packed like sardines, very uncomfortable, no doubt, but a great crowd. So that King Harry V addressing his troops will seem to rally not only the dozen or 16 hired men of the actor's company on the stage, but the packed groundlings in the yard as well and Mark Antony's Roman audience, since there's no intervening gulf will extend far beyond the rails that guard the front edge of the stage. And the third thing is that the whole relationship between actors and audience is different from what, at least until quite recently, we've been used to in the modern theater. We are accustomed, aren't we, to sit back in uh, more or less comfortable chairs, watching in detachment something which takes place in a different milieu from ours. We sit in darkness and an impalpable barrier separates us from what's happening up here under the lights. If we are moved to pity and fear, we are moved privately or at most in a sort of covert sympathy with our next door neighbors, stealing a furtive glance to see if they catch the same impression as we do. 
Mm. If we are moved to laughter, we laugh certainly at the prompting of the actors and maybe take the infection from the laughter of others, but, but we don't turn and rally our friends in the audience. We don't heckle the speaker. We are an audience, a passive company of spectators, not the participants in a rowdy public meeting or the rollicking crowd at a football match, sometimes good-humoured, sometimes in ugly vein. It's not difficult to imagine the relationship of the Chamberlain's men to the groundlings. If we extend from the stage to the yard, the vaudeville humor of the, the cobra, you remember that mender of bad souls in the opening scene of Julius Caesar? Or for that matter, the cries of the mob in the forum as Antony mounts the rostrum. What does he say of Brutus? To our best, he speaks no harm of Brutus here. <coughs> There's a story told of how during a performance of a play <coughs> on the Trojan theme, this was not Shakespeare, but it was a play on the familiar, the famous uh, scene of the uh, sack of Troy. At that um, moment when the unarmed Hector was surrounded by Achilles and his myrmidon thugs ready for the kill, a fair-minded butcher among the groundlings, wanting to see fair play, leapt the stage rails and laid about him with his cleaver to such good effect that he routed the would-be murderers and, but for the intervention of Hector himself, would have changed the whole course of the Trojan War. <laughs> <coughs> Uh, but it's not only the obstreperous groundlings who are in close contact with the players, there are also those highly intelligent lawyers from the inns of court in that middle gallery, the avant-garde, London's equivalent of the university wits, and the noble, <coughs> the, the, the noble patrons, those judicious whose censure, as Hamlet tells us, must overweigh a whole theatre of others. When Macbeth, standing at the very front of the stage, asks, why do I yield to that suggestion whose horrid image doth unfix my hair and make my sated heart knock at my ribs against the use of nature? He is sharing his sense of guilt with the judicious in the gallery, being nearer to them, so it seems, than to his fellow thanes at the back of the stage with all that fog and filthy air of the blasted heath between them and him. This sense of contact, of involvement, to use a fashionable modern word, this depends very largely upon the fact that we in the audience and the actors on the stage are in the same neutral daylight. This is of the first importance. It depends also upon the fact that we are all around them on three sides, that they are in our midst. We in the audience are participants on the edge of a central group, not detached spectators of a distant moving picture. We don't see them in a frame or against a background. They are in three dimensions, like sculpture, not flat like painting. We feel them to be among us, and we feel with them as they do and suffer, as if they were living their fictitious lives in reality. It's difficult to convey this difference of feeling in words, but a spectator sitting beside the rush-strewn stage of our Midsummer Night's Dream at Harrow said to me, afterwards, it was like being out in the wood yourself. And the corollary of this central position and the neutral daylight is the all-important realization that the stage is the main acting arena for long stretches of the play quite independent of the building behind it, except insofar as the actors must come out of this building to tell their story and go back into it when they wish to be hidden from view. The doors of entry are often simply a means of access to the acting arena out here. So much then for the stage and auditorium. Now for the backstage building, the tiring house in which the actors are tired themselves and from which they sallied forth to tell their story. One most important consideration when reconstructing, whether in imagination or in fact, the Elizabethan Playhouse, is to make this tiring house a permanent feature. The audience entering the Playhouse should know what they would see, always basically the same, with maybe different hangings for tragedy, comedy, or history, and other adjusted features of furniture or properties to suit the play of the afternoon but basically the same architectural structure. Uh, the excited interest for the audience coming into the Playhouse for each new production would be, what will the poet and his fellow actors turn it into this time? There is, at any rate, no doubt among the scholars that at either end of the tiring house facade there are doors. Uh, these two great stage doors will be substantial in height and width
for they have to admit the mass exits and entrances of a riotous mob or an army carrying banners and pikes. They'll often be just a means of access to the stage. When the army comes on, it's manifestly not marching through a doorway. Or in a woodland setting, when, as the folio text tells us, enter the king of fairies at one door with his train and the queen at another with hers, we naturally don't think of them as doors. On the other hand, there are occasions when a door will be precisely what it is. And in such case, the action and the dialogue will make the circumstances clear. Consider, for instance, the opening scene of Othello. Now, here comes Roderigo bursting impetuously uh, from one of the doors, let's say this left-hand door, <coughs> and he is full of protest, and Iago, following more phlegmatically, is at pains to calm him down. We're not to think of them as coming out of a door. They emerge from the towering house to begin the play. They are walking through the streets, and their progress brings them onto the stage. They are, you'll notice, in the middle of a conversation. Now, as they saunter around the front of the stage, around the perimeter, Iago, in two or three vivid speeches, puts us in touch with the situation and with his own concealed hatred of the moor, and suddenly, as they complete their half-circle of the stage, Roderigo, standing in front of the right door, whispers, here is her father's house. I'll call aloud. Whereupon, both of them shatter the silence of the night with like timorous accent and dire yell, as when, by night and negligence, the fire is spied in populous cities. In this scene, therefore, this right door is the door of Brabantio's house, Desdemona's father's house. And we shall shortly see the old man uh, at the window above the door, while the left is simply a means of access to the stage. And so likewise, in As You Like It, when Orlando comes home in, in good spirits after his victory in the wrestling match, old Adam, the faithful retainer, is standing in the doorways and warns the young man, O oh, unhappy youth, come not within these doors. Within this roof, the enemy of all your gracious lives, your brother. And this night he means to burn the lodging where you used to lie, and you within it. And Orlando realizes that he must flee, and the good old man not only offers him his life's savings, but also begs leave to accompany him in his flight. And his joy at being accepted as his young master's escort is tempered by sadness as he turns back to this doorway from 17 years till now almost fourscore here live I. But now live here no more. The stage door is here not only doing practical duty as a house door, but has very effective dramatic life as the symbol of a lifelong happiness at home to be forfeited at last in enforced exile. What lies between these doors, we do not know. We are warned by the experts against talking about an inner stage, and there are good practical reasons against confining scenes to the so-called study of the globe playhouse. But if we ask ourselves, as in this voyage of conjecture we must constantly do, what did the Chamberlain's men do? The answer will probably be something of this kind. For certain scenes, items of simple architecture or furniture, I don't say scenery because this suggests visual illusion, are disclosed in the middle of the towering house facade between these doors. I have in mind such examples as the gates of a castle, the breach in the wall at half fleur once more into the breach, a throne on a dais. And this may have been done by drawing the curtains of a shallow inset space or by means of a temporary booth-like structure built out in front of the facade. Never mind how it was done, but then, this is the important fact, and that the whole stage then takes temporary color from this disclosure or exposure. It may be the doors of Gloucester's house, which are closed to shut out old King Lear, while his cruel daughters take refuge inside from the gathering storm. It may be that moss bank described by Oberon a moment before on the bare stage, so that when it does appear, we recognize at once the bank where the wild thyme blows, the bank on which Titania is to lie asleep and forgotten through some hundreds of lines of the play until that most famous moment when the Queen of the Fairies, long unnoticed by the audience, is rudely woken by Bottom's braying baritone and cries out, what angel wakes me from my flowery bed? There's no question here or in any of the scenes I've mentioned of the action being confined to the inset or disclosure space. We have all the freedom of the stage itself 
related when the story demands it and not only then to the uh, furniture disclosed here. I can give you two examples from Julius Caesar where we can see most clearly this fluid interrelation of stage and disclosure. The first is at the beginning of what uh, the textbooks call Act Three, the passage which leads up to the assassination. The stage is thronged with the crowd of commoners out here. Among them, that anonymous soothsayer, the Ides of March man, you remember, and his rival practitioner, who is called Artemidorus. And the procession of senators enters the stage by one of the great doors, and they move at a stately pace round the perimeter. And Caesar exchanges a word with the soothsayer. The Ides of March are come. I, Caesar, but not gone. And then, as he reaches the front of the stage, he is accosted by Artemidorus, who wants him to read his, his schedule, I'm sorry. And this paper, <laughs> we in the audience know, contains a categorical indictment of all the conspirators by name and a hint of their purpose. And scenting danger, two of the conspirators present a rival petition, and Cassius drives the suitor away with a brusque rebuff. What urge you your petitions in the street? Come to the Capitol. And then Caesar, with petitioners importuning his path on either side, moves slowly from the front up the middle of the stage towards the towering house. And as he approaches the facade, the curtains in the center part and disclose uh, seats on a dais. Perhaps there's room for three senators. And before we know what's happened, after a few brief moments of panic among the conspirators at the front of the stage there, because one of the senators who is not in the plot greets them with the ambiguous words, I wish your enterprise today may thrive. Caesar, sitting on the central seat in the discovery space, speaks in his public dictatorial tone, are we all ready? What is now amiss that Caesar and his senate must redress? And thus easily does the whole stage, which was the street, become the Senate House, the Capitol, and the violent struggle of Caesar's murder. If you want to see how violent the action is, you must read the account, as Shakespeare certainly did in North Plutarch. The struggle surges all over the vast stage and ends, I've no doubt, with Caesar falling at the base of Pompey's statue beside one of the stage posts. This method of changing the scene from outdoors to in, from stage to stage come discovery, is used again in Julius Caesar at the beginning of the famous quarrel scene in the latter half of the play. Here, the armies of Brutus and Cassius have marched on to the bare stage. That is, banner, drum, and trumpet, and a couple of officers, a token army, one army from each of the two doors. And Cassius blurts out his complaint without ceremony or hesitation. Most noble brother, you have done me wrong. But Brutus cuts him short before the eyes of both our armies here, which should perceive nothing but love from us. Let us not wrangle. Bid them move away. Then in my tent, Cassius, enlarge your griefs. And Cassius gives orders to his men to withdraw. And Brutus says, let no man come to our tent till we have done our conference. Let Lucius and Titinius guard our door. Manet, Brutus, and Cassius, says the folio. Clear in intention, if somewhat faulty in Latin grammar. <coughs> what in fact has happened? <coughs> what did the Chamberlain's men do? The two armies withdrew, each by the door through which it entered the stage. And Brutus's officers <coughs> opened the discovery space and withdraw through it, leaving Brutus and Cassius alone. What is discovered? Well, undoubtedly a table for the drumhead conference later in the scene, when Brutus says to his fellow officers, now sit we close about this table, this taper here, and call in question our necessities. And no doubt for a few lines of the scene, the four are sitting close about this taper at the table, and there, inset into the facade of the towering house, the taper would show to best effect, even in the London afternoon. And no doubt at this table, Brutus is sitting with his book, after the boy Lucius has fallen asleep in the middle of his song and the taper burns ill so that he cannot read and imperceptibly we find ourselves in the presence of Caesar's ghost. But for most of this scene, and it is the longest, most elaborate and subtlest scene in the play in its interchange of contrasting mood, the action ranges over the whole stage which has ceased to be the open ground where the armies met and has become the inside of Brutus's tent. So then, if we are building in imagination or in fact our 20th century globe, let us by all means leave that debated space between the doors 
adaptable. <laughs> One season we may try out Walter Hodge's impermanent special projecting structure. Another we may experiment with Dr. Adams's inset study. But that withdrawal behind curtains, even to Shakespeare's audience, may have seemed a characteristic symbol of the end of an afternoon's play, we may perhaps infer from a fine poem attributed to Sir Walter Raleigh, <coughs> with, by the way, an equally fine musical setting by Orlando Gibbons, in which our life is compared to the action of a play in the theatre. What is our life? A play of passion. Our mother's wombs, the tiring houses be, where we are dressed, for this brief comedy, our graves that hide us from the searching sun are like drawn curtains when the play is done. It looks as if this was a recognizable symbol. <coughs> we shall certainly erect the two stage posts to stand well forward on the stage. These are structurally important, for they hold up the canopy over the stage. They're also very useful to the actors and their director in giving some shape and pattern to the stage itself and some logic to the movement and grouping of the figures on it. For instance, there seems to be a walk round the front of the stage from one door to the other outside the post, what I have been calling the perimeter. This would give some definition to the walking in the street of Rodrigo and Iago in the opening scene of Othello, which I've already described. And so when the folio text of Romeo and Juliet tells us of the maskers, that's Romeo, Mercutio, Benvolio and others, on their way to gate crash at the Capulet feast, that they march about the stage and serving men come forth with their napkins, we may imagine the maskers sauntering round the perimeter while the serving men begin to create for us the illusion of the feast by emerging from or being discovered in the curtained cent center of the Taring House. The posts, too, have the effect of cutting off those forward corners of the stage from the rest. When those three witches have wound up their charm in a magic circle in the sp center space between the posts, at the sound of the drum, they will lurk downstage outside that left post while Macbeth and Banquo stagger from the right door against the weather, and the fog and filthy air will make to the mind's eye of the beholder a barrier a great distance between the two groups. You can dodge behind the post. You can appear to hide behind it from your enemy or your victim. You can even hide on the audience's side of the post so that they can see what you're doing, while the enemy or victim cannot. Visualize Falstaff and his gang sharing the swag after their highway robbery, and Paul in their buckram suits of disguise cling one to each post, plainly visible to us, but unseen to the highwaymen. You know, we, too, seem to be lurking with them, ready to pounce on their prey. It's much more fun for us that way. <coughs> much of the time, the posts will, like the doors and the rest of the permanent architecture, be invisible to the eye of make-believe. But then again, as the circumstances demand, they will serve their purpose in the telling of the story. They may be uh, pillars in an interior scene, uh, one or other or both of them may become trees in the forest or in the open country. Here, Father, take the shadow of this tree, says Edgar to Gloucester in the last act of King Lear. Uh, Aaron the Moor in Titan. Verona can be tied to such a post and breed a whole series of outrageous puns on the word tied. <coughs> Mark Antony, almost overrun by the rioting mob, can spring on the base of one to recapture their attention. You have forgot the will I told you of. <coughs> but meanwhile, it is not be forgotten that their original purpose was to support the canopy of the heavens the heavens with the underside painted blue and decorated with the sun and stars or the signs of the zodiac, the heavens are an essential feature of this playhouse overhanging the stage, which was Shakespeare's world. When the Thane of Ross comments on the unnatural darkness that follows on the night of Duncan's murder, the actor points aloft to the canopy as he says, thou seest the heavens as troubled with man's act 
threatens his bloody stage, heaven's act stage, they're all part of the same theatrical metaphor. And Hamlet, too, in a familiar passage, speaks of this most excellent canopy, the air, look you, this brave or hanging firmament. And important in somewhat the same way for the symbolical part it plays in Shakespeare's imitation of the universe is that trap door which gives access to hell below the stage. This, again, is a technical term, the hell. <laughs> All the world is a stage, you remember, and conversely, the stage lying between heaven and hell is all Shakespeare's world. I'm very content with it, he was. This trap door was, by the regular practice of the Elizabethan stage, the source from which ghosts and devils rose. Uh, by this trap door, the ghost of Hamlet's father descends into his prison house, and under the stage is the cellarage from which that perturbed spirit cries, swear to his son's oath. Ghost cries under the stage, says the folio. <coughs> the trapdoor will need to be large enough to accommodate Ophelia's coffin. I remember an occasion when it was not. <laughs> <laughs> And no doubt it could be put to more convivial uses than uh, by, by the resourceful poet and his inventive collaborators. From this, Sir Toby and Sir Andrew with bottles and tankards and a candle preceding them may emerge in the small hours of the morning as if from the cellar of the Lady Olivia's house with the comfortable doctrine that not to be abed after midnight is to be up betimes. <coughs> And there will also, in our reconstruction, be accommodation for acting above here. And again, in the uncertain state of current conjecture and debate, it will be best for the architect of our new globe to leave room for experimental adaptation here. But in any case, Juliet must have the opportunity to open her casement and Romeo to descend his rope ladder. Richard Plantagenet must appear as doth the blushing discontented sun from out the fiery portal of the east on the battlements of Flint Castle and must be able to describe his surrender to Bullingbrook in such terms as down, down I come like blistering Theoton wanting the manage of unruly jades. It is indeed tempting to toy with the experiment of Dr. Adams's chamber up above there, especially for scenes of domestic intimacy. The ladies at home, as for instance, Portia and Larissa in the second scene of The Merchant of Venice, detaching them from the busy traffic of the stage below, <coughs> or for the static Orsino scenes in Twelfth Night, or for the subplot of King Lear, in which the private business of the Earl of Gloucester's household up there is continually contrasted with the public traffic of the main plot. And I wish I could find time to persuade you of the shape of the last act of Macbeth, that great fifth act, which becomes a farcical anticlimax in any other playhouse. While Malcolm and Macduff and their English allies march and countermarch on the broad stage below, up there, up above, strongly fortified in great Dunsinane, is Macbeth's distempered cause, the sickly wheel, the mind diseased, the perilous stuff that weighs upon the heart. He is penned in up aloft there, cribbed, cabined, and confined. Uh, modern jargon has a word for his condition of claustrophobia, and that entails having the famous sleepwalking scene at the beginning of the act, up aloft there in the chamber. And Mrs. Siddons and Ellen Terry and all the famous ladies who have played this part won't like that. They'd prefer to hog the main stage. <laughs> but we must remember that the first Lady Macbeth was a boy who could be told what to do <laughs> and if recalcitrant could be put quite literally in his place. <laughs> this though is where the actual dimensions and proportions of the building are of paramount importance. We might find that the above there was well in the picture, that it could indeed dominate the playhouse, that Burbage as Macbeth for instance would choose no other place to utter his great invocation of the murderous dusk in which Banquo is to be assassinated, come sealing night, scar up the tender eye of pitiful day, and out on the stage below come his hired assassins. So let us in our reconstruction leave room to experiment with such an acting area above. And by the same token, let it be possible to use the music room.
very higher still, in case it was a regular feature of the globe's performances. We need not use these items or even be shown them, but let there be the chance to use them if we wish. He must surely be a sad pedant or a constitutional spoil sport who doesn't read with delight Dr. Adams' pages about the shipboard scenes in the Elizabethan theater, in which, and I quote him, the platform stage serves as the main deck, the terrace as the raised quarter deck, and the music gallery as the main top or crow's nest. <coughs> the pleasure of assisting at the shipwreck of the Tempest, Act One, Scene One, can only be savored by actual experience. But you can see, can't you, in your mind's eye, the king and his court surging up from the trap door, that's from their cabins, and the boatswain on the stage itself, the deck bidding them keep below, and the master on the terrace, and the ship boy up in the music room, and an able-bodied seaman bailing water over the rail, and perhaps a seasick passenger making his offering to the fishes in the yard. <coughs> Never mind that the masts seem to be rather oddly placed on either side of the deck. All the noise of the storm from the backstage men behind the towering house facade and the added sound of the climax of rending timber, we split, we split, and when all is lost, what follows? Uh, Prospero and Miranda are uh, discovered, must it not be so, in the center of the towering house wall, and the calm after the storm is introduced by her words, if by your art, my dearest father, and thereafter the long narrative exposition of Prospero with Miranda and Ariel and Caliban, and the first encounter with Prince Ferdinand, this will take place on the bare stage, with some suggestion of the magician's full poor cell in the center of the towering house wall, and there's always the trap door for use as Caliban's hole, where Prospero styes him in this hard rock. Improvisation, make do, make believe, are the very lifeblood of the theater. We must assume that the Chamberlain's men were, like all their profession, by nature and training, adaptable, inventive, resourceful, ready to improvise and to create illusion. After all, they were often driven out of their London playhouse because of the plague or other inhibitions, and they were obliged to adapt their staging to all manner of inconvenient settings. We may, moreover, credit the Burbages and their syndicate with a good deal of architectural invention in the building of the globe, and suppose, indeed, that in building the second globe after the first one was burnt to the ground, they profited from their experience in using the first. It is a blend of practical sense, imaginative conjecture, and empirical experiment that's needed to help us recreate the atmosphere of a performance in Shakespeare's lifetime. Let us not be afraid, as I've said, to entertain conjecture. We must be bold, too, like the Chamberlain's men, and not afraid of being wrong. So much, then, for the structure. And now, for the feel of the performance, from the point of view of the audience the psychological atmosphere. I'm sure that the very tang and taste of the open air would make a difference, and the uncompromising neutral daylight of the London afternoon. Walter Hodges speaks somewhere of birds flying down into the yard in the evening to pick up the crumbs left by the afternoon audience. And if this sounds, he continues, merely a picturesque sentimentality, Consider, nevertheless, what a very different setting it conveys in reality. No artificial light that I've yet seen can really be the equivalent of To us, with our ideas of the theater and the theatrical, the conditions prevailing at the globe, the diffused uh, daylight without obtrusive direction of shadow, because the globe towering house had its back to the afternoon sun, uh, this might seem to be the very reverse of what would impress an audience. Why, even in the world of sport now, artificial lighting is becoming the rigueur, the, the fashion. You know, football itself is more often played after the sun has set. We should be looking back soon to the strange days when there was no flood lighting. But the Globe Playhouse, anyway, belongs to the era before the flood. <laughs> I, I apologize for the pun, but it's necessary to make this point. <coughs> and I think it would be like sitting, watching the tennis championships on the center court at Wimbledon. Uh, I think I can still say in this country, Forest Hills for this year, can I not? Uh, part of the crowd <coughs> under cover 
but quite a large proportion of groundlings under the open sky and the game itself in the open air. And there you have this great concentration of a crowd upon certain individuals active in their midst. You can't really see the shifting expressions on their faces as you could if you were watching them in grease paint under theater lights or under the microscopic lens of the movie camera or on television. But you are acutely aware of their movements and their gestures. And if these tennis players are like actors of the demonstrative kind, and heaven knows we have plenty examples nowadays, you will understand their moves, you will feel with them the agony of a row of match points, deuce vantage server, deuce vantage striker, the tiebreaker, the frustration of a linesman's doubtful decision. You will find yourself groaning aloud in sympathy, protesting audibly, and when your champion scores a point, giving vent to your elation in spontaneous cheers. But there is a difference here. What happens on our tennis court is, after all, predictable. We know the rules, and the plot is stereotyped and somewhat repetitive. It needs no further interpretation than the monotonous pronouncements of the umpire. We know right from the start what the principal actors are trying to do. <coughs> but as we sit in the top gallery of the globe, we don't know at all what's going to happen. We don't even know who the principal figures are.